Hello everybody, welcome to this last talk about the game session. I will present Globulation 2, a free software real-time strategy game with a new take on micromanagement. As m with most open source projects, this game is not the result of a single individual, but the result of a whole community. And I would like to thank everyone who contributed time and resources to Globulation 2. And this game will not, of course, be what it is without the support of all those people who are not there today, but are critical to this game. Oops. So, the outline. Uh, we'll begin by exploring the founding principle of globulation and what are the basis of the gameplay and the design of the game from a player point of view, not from a technical point of view. Then we'll have a look at the architecture and how uh, this is implemented. Uh, it will be an overall view. Later we'll have a more detailed view on some specific subsystems such as the network or the pathfinding or the task allocation algorithm. Near the end of the talk, we'll talk a bit about the community, and in the end, we'll have some conclusion and remark about the future of the game. So behind the globulation adventure, there is a reason. Uh, and this whole ID started from an uh, analysis that a strategy game should focus on strategy and not on micromanagement. When we began, a friend of mine and myself, uh, Globulation, around 10 years ago, most of the real-time strategy game were mixing heavily the strategic aspect and uh, the micromanagement aspect. If you imagine games such as uh, Warcraft or even Starcraft, and they all have a very important micromanagement aspect. While it can be very interesting for some players, it's also a drawback for some others that would like to concentrate on the strategy and are uh, distracted by, the, by this very uh, action part of the game. So we tried to, to make this element better. To do so, we had a look around us and we were thinking in which uh, type of uh, environment there is this uh, strategy without micromanagement. And one uh, inspiration was the ant colonies. In end colonies, there is a colony level development that is quite advanced, but there is no micromanagement in the sense that there is no overmind who is overlooking the development of the colony. So we go ahead and implemented uh, a game based on this uh, idea. And this is the basis of the ecology of globulation. There is three key elements in this ecology. The first element is the resources. They are providing all the basic material for the elements of the game. Uh, the second element is the units, that is the moving part of the game. And the third element are the buildings. The resources are of different types. The first one is the wood, which is used to build buildings. The second is the wheat, which is used to feed units. In globulation, the units have to heat, which uh, is not common in a real-time strategy game, but gives very interesting dynamics to the game. There is also the seaweed, which is a type of resource used to make advanced buildings, such as uh, the schools. There is the stones, which is a resource that never gets depleted and is used to make uh, buildings that are uh, very robust, such as the different towers. And there is the fruits, which is a resource that is used to give uh, happiness to the unit. The units can harvest and also clear the resources. And the units are of uh, several types. There is the walkers, who are the basic unit who build things and transport things. There is the explorers, who are the unit that goes around and discover the map, which is very important for any game where the information uh, war is a very important aspect. And there is, of course, the warriors. There are the units that can fight. The buildings are of several types also. There is the swarms, which is sort of uh, living buildings which produce units. There is the inns where the units can go and eat. Uh, there is the schools where the units can go and uh, get better and then can upgrade buildings to make them much more efficient. There is the hospital where units, when they are wounded, they can go and they get repaired. There is the racetracks and the pools, which are uh, buildings that upgrade units, uh, respectively, the speed of wall can swim. There is the barracks, which train the units to fight. And there is the tower, which are defense buildings. 
The unit, the units build, repair, fill, and upgrade the buildings, and in return, the buildings feed, heal, and upgrade the units. With this ecology, we designed the first game, which was Globulation One. We designed it between 1999 and 2000. It consisted of uh, 20,000 lines of Think Pascal code. We had the macOS classic version. It was single player. And in this game, the units have their own lives. They individually upgrade. They walk. They eat. And uh, the player has very limited control. It's, uh, it only uh, chooses ratio of buildings and units. And everything else man is managed by the game. The game uh, manages the units, which move randomly. Room move randomly. They place buildings randomly. They build buildings randomly. And they find resources randomly. When resources are found, they go to the resources, uh, or the units go to the resources using pheromones. And this resulted in a funny uh, simulation in the same, same idea as artificial life, but was not really fun to play, because basically we could only, only change some parameters, so it might be good for a scientific article, but not for a game. Furthermore, it is old now, and the graphics are not really nice. So, but we decided to make a second game because the idea of uh, reducing the micromanagement seemed promising. So then we made Globulation 2. As you can see, the graphics have already much improved, but this is only the visible part of the iceberg. There is a lot of changes under the hood. Uh, it's now in C++. It consists of 100,000 lines. It has been developed now for the last seven years. It is cross-platform, it is multiplayer. And also the units retain their own lives. The player now has a much wider range of actions. And the player can now decide where he wants to place buildings. Uh, he can decide uh, which buildings he wants to upgrade or repair. He can place flags, which is a way to control groups of units. So this gives the ability to control the units more or less directly without uh, having any, any micromanagement. For instance, if you have a war flag, you can say, I want 10 units at that point, and if the units need to go to eat, other units will come uh, to ensure that there is still your 10 units at the war flag. So this way, you have the control of what happens, but still you don't have to take care of the micromanagement. The player, of course, specified which a um, number of units is allocated to each building to build or to repair or to work at the building, like filling the hidden. And also, the player can specify some area that are um, areas where the units can get attracted or repelled. For instance, there is the guard area, which allowed idle warriors to go. Uh, instead of just wandering around, they are attracted to this area and then they can be useful, like defending uh, against unexpected attacks. The game assigns units, units to buildings and flags, so this is done automatically. Player never controls directly one unit. The, the games also manage unit food, health, and upgrades, in the sense that the units decide them, themselves when they want to hit or when they, there is an open building for upgrades or um, to work on. And the game also takes care of every pathfinding, so you never have any pathfinding problem. And the result of this is an innovative, fun, and extensible gameplay. Uh, it's innovative because I don't think there is much other game that has this particular type of gameplay. It's fun, it opens a new way to, to think games, and it's, it is extensible in the sense that we can add elements to what is now. Now we have a core of this gameplay, but in the future we can add a lot of new elements. It's open, it's not closed. <coughs> no, all this is implemented from a software point of view. Basically, the overall structure is the following. We use several libraries, the C++ standard libraries, also the Boost extension libraries. We use the Z libraries to, com to implement compression. Uh, to access the underlying Windowsing system and everything that is platform dependent, we use SDL, and we have an OpenGL accelerated backend. So, if you have a fast graphics card, 
you will be able to play at very high resolution with no slowdown. And if you have a device or your device driver does not support it, you can still fall back to the software implementation. Uh, we also use SDL ImageNet and TrueType font rendering. We use Speaks for voice over IP. That is currently only working on Linux, but we have the intention to extend this to all platforms. We use Vorbis Org to play music and FreeBD to have a right to left text rendering. In the game itself, uh, we have a big uh, structure, which is the game engine, which takes care of updating the game state. We also have the map editor, which access this same state but does not update it. And we have, of course, several uh, small sub subsystems, such as the network, the graphical user interface, the display, the input, and the music subsystem. The most interesting part, of course, is the game engine, which we will have a look into now. The game engine consists of a map. A map is a rectangular grid of cases and sectors. So cases is small cell, and it contains information about the terrain, the resources, the units, and the buildings present at this cell. In the cell, there can be only one unit or one building or one resources at the same time. There is also the sectors, which contain elements that encompass several cells, such as the ballet or some animations. This map does not contain the state of the unit and the buildings themselves, but rather an identifier which uh, is used to access the states of uh, the buildings and the units which are inside the teams. The, the teams uh, is an array of structure, uh, one per team, which is a color in the game, and uh, a team is a faction, and uh, each faction has a list of buildings and units, and in this list, each building has some information that are dynamic, that, is, that are different to each building instances, such as the position, the hit point, same for the unit also, position, hit point, and several other variables. Those buildings and units are parameterized by static information that describe the types of the units and type of the buildings. For the buildings, uh, it's called buildings type, and it describes the ability, the size, the sprite, all this data about the buildings. Uh, for the unit, there is this race uh, structure, which uh, also describes the same for the unit. Both those uh, structures are uh, parameterized by text files, so they can be edited by contributors to tune the gameplay. Uh, the last structure is the player, that is uh, the controlling entity for a faction, and there can be several controlling entities for a faction in this engine. Uh, for instance, if you have a player and an artificial intelligence that are playing together. This was a static view. Now let's have a look at the more dynamic view. Uh, if we have an information flow point of view, you have the player, which can be human or artificial intelligence, that control the game through orders. The orders are a way to describe the action of those players. They can either transit to the network to another computer, or they go directly to the game logic. The game logic will process the order, update the game state, and display it, which will give the feedback to the user, to the player, or if it's an artificial intelligence, it will directly hook into the game logic to get those informations. Now let's have a look a bit more detail how those orders got exchanged through the, net, through the network. Glob2 features a synchronous game engine. That is, the execution of the game is the same as parallel and parallel on all the computers. It's based on TCP with order getting exchange, exchange to a meta server that just basically route the orders from one computer to the other. This meta server also initiates game connections and, as I said, routes the data. Thus, the players only exchange order. The good things with this is it only uses the smallest possible bandwidth because basically just the action like the click are exchanged and if the player just scroll the map or don't do anything, there is no, no information exchange. It uh, provides a small and uniform latency, and with the order, we also exchange a checksum of the game state that ensure that cheating by state modification is impossible. Of course, this is not perfect, and there is several drawbacks. For instance, the most important thing is that the code execution must be, must be predictable. 
as the game is running in parallel in all the computers of all the players, every code, ex including the artificial intelligence code, must be completely predictable. That removes a lot of possibility for coding, floating points are forbidden, some sorting algorithms are forbidden also because the implementation of them are not predictable, and some containers are very uh, difficult to use properly, such as sets, because there is a lot of unpredictability in them. And of course, this cannot preview, prevent view sheeting. Everyone can uh, modify his client to uh, view what the other are viewing. Now, when you are running in a network, you have some latency. So basically, it works like this to overcome this latency. At some time, let's say t equals zero, there is two computers with two players, and they all uh, do some actions. So the comp those computers send or create orders and send them to the network. In the same time, they queue locally the order, and they will execute those orders the one they have queued, queued and the one for the other computer after a certain amount of time, which corresponds to the latency. If the order have not come yet, the game uh, waits for the order, but of course this latency is usually computed such that there is no such uh, waiting. Now we'll have a look at two other subsystems that are of interest. The subsystems are the pathfinding and the task allocation algorithm. <coughs> in globulation, the pathfinding are linked to targets. That means that the units do not pathfind themselves, but rather the pathfinding are attached to the destination of the unit. The destination can be the buildings, the resources, or the area. The pathfinding, the path created by the pathfinding are used by the unit, which requests the targets to create the path on demand. If there is congestion, like there is a lot of units that want to go into a specific target, uh, this path is locally overridden by the units, but globally it's managed by the target. This approach has some drawbacks. It takes a large amount of CPU time, and uh, to make it efficient enough, it took a substantial amount of development time. But uh, we like it because it's good, it's working well, and in general, your pathfinding in the game must be perfect. Otherwise, it may easily kill your game because the player gets frustrated. Of course, there is some uh, big game vendor that can not take this into account. The algorithm of the pathfinding is based on having gradients to the target. So imagine you have a pile of sand and you want to go to the top. It's very easy because you just have to follow the maximum ascent. Uh, so we create uh, the, the path uh, starting from a target using gradient propagation in, uh, with an algorithm that we'll have a look into some moment later. And then the units only use gradient ascent to go to the target. This algorithm is good because it provides a complete exploration of all accessible map parts. And its complexity is quite large, but it's a polynomial. It's uh, in the uh, order of the amount of target multiplied by the size of the map. So how does it work? Let's imagine a very simple map. We have a target denoted T, and we have two units denoted U. We have also an obstacle which is in white. At the first step, we initiate some value to the target, uh, for instance, 255. Uh, 55, oui, yes. And then we set up the value around the target at this value minus one. In this case, it's 154. And we recursively will continue to do so, uh, always uh, setting the value of a cell to the smallest value of all its neighboring cell minus one, which will do something like this. Then, when we have updated all the cell of the map, uh, we can just uh, go from any point to the target if there is um, a value by following the maximum value of the all the cell around. In this case, the two units can easily go to the target following those uh, values. Now let's have a look at another important part of the game, which is the task allocation. 
In Gabulation 2, units are allocated to tasks that, that are basically resources transport using a market-based approach. In this market-based approach, units that are free, that have nothing to do, for instance, that have finished their job or that just get out of inns, they can subscribe to lists such as uh, working unemployment lists. The buildings, once the units, uh, they also subscribe to lists. And then there is an algorithm uh, which sort the list according to some priority. For instance, the inns get higher priority and the higher level buildings also get higher priority. Then there is a greedy allocation that allocates one unit per building per allocation one, which ensure that uh, there is a fair allocation of the units to the buildings. So now we have we had just some look into some uh, uh, software aspect of globalization, but of course, as with uh, any uh, open source project, the community is a very important aspect, if not the most important one. So globalization provides several ways to interface with the community. If you just have the binary, you can already have a lot of interaction with the game. You can play it, of course, but you can also contribute to it by making maps or editing campaigns. You can work on translation, and you can help uh, by testing the game and tuning the gameplay through the text file I've already mentioned. If you want to go a bit further and want, for instance, to exchange some graphics or change some music, there is a virtual file system which allows to very easily change any external file of the game without having to actually modify the distribution of the game just by overriding them using a directory in your own folder. And you can, of course, help with the documentation. If you want to go a bit further, you can use the source and do some coding or further documentation. Globalization 2 is also presented the web, first through its own page, which is a wiki based, so you can subscribe and help to maintain or edit it. There is a IRC channel, and there is a YOG, which is an online game system when you can connect, and it's also linked to IRC, so if you are on OG, you are visible on IRC, so you can talk with the developers. There is the mailing list, which is actually mostly used by developers, and the forum, which is actually mostly used by players. There is a bug tracker, and uh, the source code revision system we use is Mercurial. So it's a dis distributed source code system, so you can branch it and do your own uh, patch, and then you send us, and we can merge things together very easily. And of course, any game needs a community to live, so you are very welcome to join Globulation 2 community. To have a bit more insight of all this work, let's have a look at the scripting. Imagine that you want to make a map, but you don't want to have a standard uh, victory condition map. You want a map where the victory condition is to build 10 schools. So you want the first player to be able to build 10 schools win. So you can do it with the actual game scripting, which is a very easy to use scripting language. It's rudimentary, it's not generic, but it's very easy to use. In the scripting language, you have the concept of story that basically are threads that are safe. Uh, that means that you can't trash the game state even if you write buggy code. It's synchronous. They execute and all the computer uh, the same. For, of course, because of the network model we have, you are forced to have synchronous scripting. And they are serializable, which means that you can save the status of the script if you have a save game and reload it afterwards. So in this example, uh, you see that uh, you have two weight condition uh, that are weight school zero, uh, uh, one uh, bigger than nine for the, for the story one, and the weight school one, one bigger than nine for the story two, which means that the first story will block until the first player has more than nine school of level one, and the second story will block until the second player will have more than one schools of low M1. And of course, uh, the first story uh, that got past the weight will have the next two action that are win zero, which means uh, make the player zero win, and lose one makes the player one lose. And on the contrary, with the other condition, you have the invert, which means that the first story that goes there terminates the game by making the player win and the other lose. 
the scripting is nice, but it's limited. So we are currently working in a much more advanced next generation version, but that will retain the safe, synchronous, and silenceable aspect of the script. Another element is the graphism. To have a nice game, you need to have nice graphism. So this show how we made the actual graphics of the game. We first did a drawing, which you can see at the top left. Then uh, Cyril, which is just sitting there, made some coloring, which uh, you can see at the top right. And this is the current way we do graphics. In the future, we might or might not make 3D graphics. For instance, we can take back the drawing graphics and make a Blender 3D version, and then we can texture it. Right now, it's not textured yet because it's a big uh, work, but it's just to show that we can still work and improve things, starting from the actual graphism. A uh, very important aspect of any open source project is the contributors. In this slide that I've called contributors capture and storage, I want to just show a bit uh, what are the, the critical elements of the for the interaction with the contributors. First thing is that open source developers are highly volatile resources, uh, especially in a game where you don't have any company backup, so just people, they contribute and perhaps they have something more important in their life and they just stop and they can stop from one day to the other. If you have a game, you need artwork and the graphics, the artists are even more volatile. Uh, so this is a problem. A second problem is that if your game is well advanced, there's a quite good engine with a lot of capabilities, it's quite complex. And complexity is both boost and bane, in the sense that if it's complex, it provides a lot of feature, a lot of things you can do, and uh, potentially a great game. But in the same sense, there is a high entry barrier. Developers need to, lo to know a lot of things before they can contribute anything. And this can be a very big problem. It was a very big problem with globalization too, which we developed at home uh, for five years or four years, and then we made it open source, and there was a lot of complexity, a very few documentation, it was really dif very difficult for people to get into. Now that um, much more people, uh, external people have contributed to the project, it's getting easier and easier. The problem is that people come, they implement great things, and then they disappear. Of course, they don't document much because there is no pressure to do so and it's not fun to document. Another problem is that by doing so, people like to reinvent the wheel. And of course, they will invent better wheels each time, but often it's not yet finished. So you get better wheel, but less and less finished, which can be a very big problem. So as a community, you have to maintain a balance between guiding new developers into your rules and letting them express their vision, otherwise you won't have any new developer at all. So this is very difficult to uh, balance that you have to maintain. Now, as conclusion, the current situation is quite good. The code base is stable. The community is stabilizing in the sense that there is, it's growing and more lasting people are around. The core engine scales well in the sense that the same code that we wrote six or seven years ago basically still works and still capable of our, our game, even if we now have uh, games with uh, thousands of units, uh, the game is still working well and there is no problem. And the gameplay is innovative and promising. Of course, not everything is finished. Game is always a work in progress, and in the future, one critical aspect is to tune the gameplay. Because the game got a lot of work from development, but not that much feedback or advanced feedback for player yet. Already uh, quite some, but we could do much better. We should also improve campaigns and improve the user friendliness of the game. Right now, some people are afraid because they think it's a bit too complex, so we have already a good tutorial, but we have to make it better. We can hope to further reduce micromanagement, for instance, through adding new game gameplay elements. There is a lot of ID in this direction, and we hope to, to make them become reality. And why not, if there is enough demand, but enough artwork, we might uh, put 3D graphics because uh, it won't be difficult in the OpenGL mode to just have a 3D renderer for part of the game. But I think it's not really the most critical element for such a game. 
and it would be better to improve the gameplay first. And if you want to take home a message about game development, is that gameplay, atmosphere, and hard work are critical for success, more than code uh, and more than uh, speed or efficiency. You need to have a game in which play players feel well and want to contribute and make it live. So join the globalization adventure and have fun with us. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. No question? Someone wants a demo? Okay. So he wants to play versus an artificial intelligence. Let's take. So this is a. Uh, oops. <laughs> Demo effect. <laughs> Sorry. So I took a very standard map and I put for stupid but stable artificial intelligence. And now I'm, I have a swarm there with uh, some units that are getting uh, wheat to it. And I've set up two new buildings to build that are inns. It's very critical to make inns at the beginning of, a, of the game, otherwise the units can't eat and they just stupidly die. I will also make a swimming pool, which will allow the units to swim. Because initially the units do not swim, which is a problem because the sewage, which are needed for the schools, uh, are in the water. So I will also make a school, I will make an hospital, and I will make a barracks. Now I will make some more units, I will al associate more units to the swarm because only one unit is working at the swarm, it's not enough to have a, a good uh, um, number of units. I will, I will request a uh, lot of workers and some explorer and some warrior. I will put some exploration flag. No. The exploration flag basically will attract uh, explorer so that they will just go into those flags and discover the terrain under. I will put some area, I will put forbidden area onto the wheat. Uh, sorry, it's not easy to see. This is a bug of the Intel OpenGL driver, which does not render properly the line. And I will put some turret in the entrance of the base, so that other players will not easily <laughs> come into our base and destroy things if they decide to. I will also put a racetrack so that my units will be faster and I will put an additional in. Ah, yes. Which should be considered a bug. Okay. Ah, yeah, it works better. Ah yes, I have not talked about yes, I have not talked about the fact that uh, one thing we liked in in the idea of globalization is that when you is that everyone is in the center of the world, because basically the world is a to toroidal topology, which means that the left is the right and the top is the bottom, and everyone begins in the center, which is interesting uh, for the dynamics of the world but can be complicated if you play in network and you ask your friend, where well, are you? Oh, I'm in, the I'm in the middle and I'm also in the middle. This is the reason we have put some mark tool, which does not work. <laughs> is the autosave... Uh, 
is the autosave uh, feature working again? The autosave reloads feature. Yes. Good. So we have an autosave reload feature. <laughs> Which means that even if it's crashed, it's not a problem. <laughs> there you can see Fritz. Fritz are very interesting because they give your unit happiness at the expense of the armor. So if your warrior takes Fritz, they get kind of happy and weak. But it's important to be happy because if uh, they are not, they can decide just to convert to the enemy. So it's a subtle uh, mm, blend. So I'm putting some walls in front of the tower to defend them in case of an attack. So now that we have explored, we can just remove the exploration flag. And we see in the minimap that there is an enemy at right. Attacking would not be wise with only one warrior, but we can if, if you want. <laughs> Sorry? Ah, yeah. Yes, they can. One can. Two can. Wow. And we will build more schools because it's more profitable to make schools than to make war. It's a very moral game. Uh, we see, if we click on a barracks, that we can't upgrade it because no uh, unit has gone to school for long enough yet. So they are still very stupid. And you can put some area. For instance, you can put area there if you want to attract the warrior. That area will ensure that idle warrior will go there with preference. I will also put one there, which is very good because otherwise you have a lot of wire that just do nothing and stay in the way of your workers, which is a very bad situation. So we see the nice uh, particle effect. So normally with a normal player or um, more Mm, powerful artificial intelligence, you can't win uh, with just one unit. <laughs> but we have several artificial intelligence, and I've taken the simplest one, which has the lowest probability to crash. And the resources, they got depleted. For instance, if you have a look there, you see that the, um, the wheat is getting depleted, but they also grow in proportion to the distance to the sea. Uh, so you have to carefully manage your resources. This is also a very different aspect with respect to other games, such as StarCraft, when we, you can just harvest at maximum. Here, if you harvest everything, you just don't get anything. So, in addition to being moral, it's ecological. Well, we'll let this warrior alone because he's angry anyway. So he will he will go to the inn. The game also provides some nice statistics about the evolution of your colony. Sorry for the bug of the driver. And you can have some map. So you can have some like starving map, which will show where the units are starving is very good. No unit is starving. Ah, yes, there is one warrior which is starving there. And you can have some other map, such as the defense map, which shows the amount of defense given the, the location. And you have some fertility map, which show you area where the wheat or the, the wood is uh, 
mm, would uh, grow more easily. We have some statistical text statistical information if you really want to. And uh, you, will, you can of course upgrade the buildings uh, once you have the unit who are able to. So for instance there I upgrade the barracks, I will upgrade one school, I will upgrade one in. I haven't clicked yet. Also upgrade one different star. Uh, I won't upgrade this race track, but when buildings upgrade, they get bigger. So I need to remove some resource first. So I will took the clearing area, and I will uh, make sure that all the unit that goes there help to remove the, um, the resources around. And I will try to make an extension in the territory of the AI. Let's go, for instance, there. We'll put a new swarm. A new in. Perhaps now you have more questions? No, still not? Want to play again? Yes, but I didn't want to make you suffer with the sound from the small uh, computer. There is music, there is no sound effect yet. The music is a dynamic mixing system, which means that you have three tracks uh, that have to be composed uh, so that they can be mixed at any time, and the music is mixed depending on the action, a bit like the iMuse system in the old LucasArts games. But the music is uh, currently not very long, but we are, some people are contributing longer music. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Yes. Not really, uh, in the sense that if you invest your time to make micromanagement, like precisely positioning the war flag, it might have some effect. But if you better manage your economy and you better uh, manage which uh, building you will upgrade at which time, and if you want to, pr because if you produce, for instance, a lot of units, uh, then uh, you will have a lot of, u of uh, unit working at the in buildings to feed them. Then you have some dynamics that go in some di direction. And maybe it's at some point not the best idea. Maybe it's better to have few units and have schools to upgrade them a lot. So micromanagement, a very small effect. The, I don't know. Yes. I request a lot of... Uh, And also with the, those area, you can really set up uh, the uh, one base. For instance, I put some uh, clear area there because I don't want the wheat to take all the place. And uh, then the, you just the, the the colony will just walk alone there. Of course, if you do this everywhere, the AI will finish by winning because you won't be able to dynamically adapt to the new uh, situation. There was a question there? Okay. <laughs> yes?
order have a, have a number, which is the time step at which they have been sent. So by ensuring that you have all the orders for all the players for a specific time step, you can execute it. So at worst, you will have some computer that will be in advance, but it will always be less than the latency. If the order times out, then the game freeze and you have the opportunity to drop the player. Yeah, Leo, perhaps you have some additional answers. Yes, the conversion system. So um, I can show my ins to the enemy, uh, to the enemy uh, teams, which will attract their units. In the sense that if I have more fits than them, which I currently does not, uh, their units, uh, they will try to convert. Ah, yes, I got one unit converted. So there, in the in the enemy's uh, town, one warrior decided to eat better at my place. He just got killed by his time teammate because people don't tend to like this. But of course, if you play this properly, it's very efficient because you can just by doing economy, uh, you can win versus an opponent that is doing a lot of war. So now I'm placing tower into the into some other fruits because you need to have a, a look at the fruits to be able to to get them. So you need to also control well the environment to make sure that uh, you have access to all the fruits. Then you have some fruits war. Uh, you have a lot of uh, war at some place just because you want to control the specific tree. It, I think it's the only game that is a strategy game when you fight for a fruit tree. So I can request more units. That means I really want its build. Any other question? Oh, I have an attack there. So I will redirect all my warrior there. But I don't have any warrior free. <laughs> because they are all trying to attack the enemy, which is so, of course, you can let your colony going alone, but if you don't react to these things, it will be bad. But we see that the walls are working well, and the tower are efficiently defending. Of course, we won't stop the unit uh, ever for infinite time, but it can stop them long enough until we got our wire there. So it's very important to have a good, uh, to have, uh, a good defense also. And I have to bid more ins because right now there is a lot of uni un new units that got converted. And I will remove the conversion because otherwise I will have too much units and my economy will collapse. Sorry? Well, it are not illegal because, you know, we showed them very nice building a lot of fruits, so they all decided to come there. So we are a bit responsible, I think. And, ah, the units have gone through the wheat because we have uh, taken too much wheat, so it's very bad because they just enter our, our colony from a side that is absolutely not defended. So that is the problem when you take too much resources out, then you get some unexpected effect. So I will put a defense tower there, just in case. So this smoke symbolizes the wall which is burning. Yes. It might be, but it's, yeah. Uh, well, some of the developers do not agree the reason of the sins, but. <laughs> okay, I think we are time out soon. If you have still one or more question. Sorry? Yes. 
No, because uh, none of the uh, existing streaming languages provides the, uh, the predictability and uh, the serializability uh, that we need. We plan to make uh, a new uh, functional light scripting languages with a very modular syntax. You can ask Martin, who is just two, three ranks <laughs> no, below, the guy who looks like me, but he's not my brother, and he can tell you a bit more into detail about it. We currently have some prototype uh, compiler and uh, runtime environment, but it's not finished yet. It's really out of work in progress. OK, so the time is out. Thank you a lot for your attention again. And I hope you will get a lot of fun playing globalization too. Thank you. <laughs>